Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to class three out of five on uh, Christian apologetics and overcoming uh, secular objections to the faith. Uh, before we launch into tonight, uh, a couple of folks have asked uh, about my background. And if you m missed it in the bulletin uh, where we had our ad while it was running, uh, I'll just quickly summarize it. My, my undergraduate was from College of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, in uh, philosophy with minors in Latin and Greek. Then, I, after uh, undergrad, I uh, came back to Chicago and studied at University of St. Mary Lake Seminary for three years uh, and uh, did all the coursework for a master's in theology, but decided that the priesthood wasn't the path God was calling me to. Uh, while I was there, just to keep busy, and I, I got an MA in philosophy from DePaul University, uh, primarily in uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th century uh, philosophy. Uh, when I looked at the job board at DePaul on what a starting salary for a philosophy uh, professor was, uh, I, I really needed a career counselor at this point. Uh, but if I remember looking at that thinking, Living in a studio in Hyde Park somewhere for the rest of my life probably wouldn't pay for my expensive hobbies like golf and, and other things. So uh, I entered the business world and, and got a, uh, an MBA from Northwestern at night while I was working. Uh, but all amidst that, I've always been very fascinated by uh, topics in theology, philosophy, history, science. And this year's program is particularly uh, close to my heart because uh, I think converts in a lot of ways are the, uh, the energy in the church uh, in the sense that if you are a cradle Catholic, we take a lot of things for granted. And I often think converts know what the stakes are uh, a lot more than cradle Catholics. Cradle Catholics might have a, a historical perspective that newly minted converts don't have, but I, I think on balance, uh, converts bring a sense of urgency and a perspective uh, that the cradle Catholics do not have, and it's a healthy perspective. So these questions of belief, disbelief, and barriers to belief have always been very fascinating uh, to me and, and personal in some ways. So that's the quick uh, background. Uh, let's recap where we've been and what we're up to tonight. You might recall in class one, we were addressing one of the linchpins of secularism or modern atheism in society, which is predominating. And one of those linchpins was that all knowledge to be valid has to take the form of scientific knowledge, namely be empirical. And we used a book written by Stephen Hawking uh, to show how that is fallacious reasoning and cannot explain the origin and being of the universe. Uh, and so that as a philosophical proposition uh, is fallacious and invalid. And we spent a lot of time addressing that. Uh, in class two, we talked about, well, what is the positive evidence for God uh, in the beginning of the universe in physics and metaphysics? And we show that there are compelling arguments from reason, without appealing to the Bible or sacred tradition, on the fact that God exists. So we, we kicked out the two foundational pillars, if you will, of secularism, namely the only valid knowledge is empirical, which we saw was circular and fallacious, and that there are arguments for the existence of God from reason, which would call into question uh, the secular project of a godless society or a society organized without reference to God. So we saw how that is uh, uh, a flight of fancy of the seculars. Tonight is another common thing you will hear, and it's a different kind of topic than what we've addressed. So the first two classes were philosophical and uh, rich in content and argument. Tonight is more historical and topical. So I'll be reading more quotations to you from history uh, to make the argument against what most secularists will lob at you uh, related to uh, religion and government, religion and society. 
And we can't let those religious fanatics uh, run society or have Judeo-Christian principles be positively promoted as the basis of society any longer. We can construct society in our sense of self without any appeal to the Judeo-Christian ethos or ethic, or uh, we can organize society and governmental policy without reference to God, which is the definition of secularism. So often you will hear at, at, in different venues or even online uh, people lobbying the same charge against this point of view of, well, <clears throat> we saw what happens when we let religious people in charge in the past, <clears throat> so we don't want to go back there. So benign secular regimes is clearly preferable. So that's what we'll be addressing tonight. And the, the two linchpins of that argument they make are the Crusades and the Inquisition. So uh, before we jump in, it's always helpful to, because you see this all the time online, or if you read articles, the comments section of articles on the web, of the vitriol uh, and almost the fanatical hatred of all things Christian in society, and the appeals are always made to religious history. The Catholic Church in history did, did X, tortured these people, killed these people, on and on and on. Also embedded in all that is a host of assumptions people make, and even uh, friends or co-workers you might have will make these assumptions in any kind of discussion. And this is very common, you'll see this all the time. You know, the first one is, all members of Christianity must live up to the highest standard or the religion is a sham. So if, if you can point to examples in history of Christians behaving badly, that's an argument for indicting the entire religion. And that subtly intimidates Christians. Uh, people will use that argument in different ways too on uh, if you try to make moral claims, something is right, something is wrong, immediately a, a secular progressive interviewer or a writer will say, well, uh, have you done things that are wrong? So the hypocrisy argument. You may not say anything about morality if you yourself have ever done something wrong. You see how the whole point is to chloroform to shut down any discussion of morality. And the same thing happens in regard to Christianity and history. The, the classic heads I win, tails you lose. So anything good that happened in medieval times or classical times was due to people overcoming Christianity in spite of the culture, and anything bad that happened at that time is due entirely to Christianity. Again, another classic, often unstated uh, assumption in these discussions. And then lastly, uh, and this is often embarrassing for the person who engages in this, but it's completely appropriate, useful, insightful to use the standards of today to judge historical uh, periods, uh, which is uh, ridiculous, but it's often done. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, terrible institutions like slavery or the role of women, uh, on and on, uh, Things that are, are historical and time-bound and often regrettable or outright wrong uh, are the people of that time are simply dismissed as fools, bigots, racists, and so forth. So uh, we have to be careful when we do that because we're really not understanding the time then. We're really not understanding the historical epic that we're talking about. And even people who teach history in universities uh, and it could be on any topic, we'll, we'll go over the methods in history, and this will be one of them, uh, to evaluate a historical era on terms of another era 500 years later is not scholarly, and it wouldn't be taken seriously in any paper. So always keep that in mind uh, when you're talking with people. These are often the debating techniques that secularists will use, and uh, they're... they're uh, worth knowing, because they're also fallacious. Let's turn now to the two prime choices, the, the prime cuts that people will always mention when talking about 
uh, religious atrocities in history as an argument for not allowing religious thought or people uh, in leadership positions. Uh, namely, uh, we'll hear this expression, uh, the separation of church and state as a safeguard against religious people imposing views uh, and torturing and killing people. Uh, there's a typo in your deck, and that should read uh, two prime choices of what inevitably happens when religion is allowed to control society and there's no separation of church and state, namely large-scale oppression and slaughter of innocents by religious fanatics. And then, as I mentioned earlier, and history is still taught this way, uh, unfortunately, the Enlightenment period, uh, which generally describes a period after the Renaissance, so say something like 1700 uh, on to, say, 1900. The Enlightenment project in history is about the emancipation of reason from religious dogma and authority, which is how the natural sciences took off, which is, as we showed in class one, again, ridiculous and ahistorical and ignorant of scientists who were Christian or Catholic uh, before the Enlightenment. Uh, and so that's the standard model, in fact, of how history is taught in those blocks. The medieval period, the age of faith, uh, the age of science, as if these things actually describe anything uh, in those periods that's meaningful. But these are always mentioned uh, as debating points that, that uh, are brought up. So let's jump in. We'll, we'll be dealing with the Crusades and the, the Inquisition generally, and then we'll focus on the Spanish Inquisition. But the myths that are advanced uh, regarding the Crusades are as follows. The so-called holy wars called for by the popes were unprovoked. These were land grabs uh, authored by the popes in Rome and the knights and princes and dukes and kings that saw this as an opportunity to grab goodies. Uh, so that's one myth that's advanced. Uh, and it is counter to the spirit of the gospel, which promotes peace and love of enemies. After all, what on earth were they up to? Why, why would they travel thousands of miles to kill innocent Muslims? They were only interested in plunder. Uh, and, oh, by the way, uh, the Jews were uh, beat up and killed by the crusaders, all with the blessing and authorization of the pope. So these are the stand these are the headlines or others, uh, and they'll vary by the crusade because there are five of them, uh, and they'll. But these are the the themes that people will repeat uh, as they consider this uh, this issue of the crusades. The headline myths uh, on the Inquisition and the Spanish Inquisition is that it was imposed uh, by the popes on reluctant and generally peace-loving imperial rulers uh, to, uh, who would have been more lenient on their population uh, to deal with heretics. Uh, these are atrocities that are unique to the Catholic Church and were meant to impose this orthodoxy uh, that is the cause of this ferocious response of the Church against uh, so-called heretics. And then, of course, as we know from uh, various scientists and professors in history, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people were killed by the Inquisition, uh, which is this horrible blemish and atrocity unique to the Catholic Church. So these myths we will address in what follows. I mentioned this in passing. Uh, there were four crusades technically there are other minor crusades you might want to uh, think about. Uh, for example, um, uh, there were minor skirmishes that came out of the four crusades, uh, but we'll only address the first crusade tonight because we don't have time. <laughs> but the first crusade contains all of the core issues that uh, people will, will use when they debate this. Like any topic, uh, we have to look at the background of what was going on before the Crusades were launched. And these, these notes from history, um, I, I could have pulled a lot more, but over the pages that follow, uh, 
I, I wanted to pull out what I considered essential. Uh, otherwise, this could be a very lengthy uh, deck. So what's interesting is there are itineraries that are existent, like Viking River cruise materials, <laughs> uh, going to the Holy Lands in the 4th century. Uh, people began making that journey uh, shortly after uh, Constantine in, say, 313, 315. People began to say, we can now travel safely uh, to the Holy Lands as a pilgrimage. And as I note here also, uh, St. Jerome and St. Paula uh, founded monasteries in Bethlehem uh, in and around 385 A.D. So you can see by, by the end of the 4th century, there was a momentum building and, and uh, volumes of people making a very dangerous trip to visit the Holy Lands. Obviously, uh, we have the rise of Islam that follows 200 years after. I give the birth and death dates that are commonly attributed to Muhammad. And what's interesting is with, by around 700 A.D., Islam had conquered uh, most of the Middle East, all of North Africa, uh, Cyprus, and most of Spain. People don't realize that Islam uh, got all the way into Spain, many parts of Spain, and in Granada. Uh, and then it goes further by the mid-8th century, so around 750 AD, in Italy, Crete, uh, and other places. So the spread of Islam was rapid and uh, large territorial gains. In these satellite places, though, Islam always remained a minority population, but they subjugated the, the general populations in those days. In the 8th century, the harassment also begins of Christian pilgrims going to the Holy Lands. And uh, what's interesting is right around this time, you have the emergence of the family tree that leads to Charlemagne. And uh, whether it's Pepin the Short, who, who was the son of Charles Martel, and, and just as a historical note, Charles Martel... Uh, defeated the Islamic armies at Poitiers in 732 A.D., otherwise we probably all would be speaking Arabic right now. Uh, that was probably one of the key battles in all of human history, uh, and if Charles Martel doesn't win that battle, probably all of Europe becomes Islamic, because there was no stopping them at that point. Uh, but continuing, uh, when Charlemagne was made king, and there's another typo who here, Leo III, not Leo XIII. Leo XIII was a 19th century pope. Uh, so Leo III was the pope in the 9th century here, so you might want to make that correction too. But once Charlemagne was king of the Franks, uh, Harun al-Rashid delivered to him the keys to the Holy Sepulcher, the banner of Jerusalem, and, and other relics. And as I mentioned here, this was a, a recognition by that Islamic leader that the king of the Franks, Charlemagne, was now the protector of the Holy Lands. And there was a sign of respect there in some ways as well. Uh, interestingly, Charlemagne, I, I mentioned in passing, took a census in Jerusalem in 808 AD. So there, this relationship has been restored of, of Christian pilgrims after the uh, victories of Islam, uh, there was a kind of a modus vivendi, a, a coexistence going on between Charlemagne and Islam, allowing Christian pilgrims to visit the, the Holy Lands again. That comes to an end. Uh, by around 10,009 uh, uh, AD, Tariq al-Hakim, the Caliph of Egypt, uh, this doesn't get a lot of press today, but he destroys the Holy Sepulcher, the tomb and the surrounding uh, monument. That was probably, uh, today we don't have the original uh, as much as the gift shop there uh, wants you to think that. It's certainly the site, so I'm not trying to cause trouble here. But it was destroyed by the Muslims in the 11th century completely and totally. Uh, obviously, it's still the site where Christ uh, rose and where he's buried. But that, that fixture was destroyed by the Islamic armies in the 11th century. So always keep that in mind when, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't go here, but if, if you breathe on a mosque incorrectly, you know, we get a, a big uproar. 
Uh, they destroyed the most holy site in Christianity in the 11th century uh, to the, the ground. Uh, you have now this animosity that kicks in of, of Christian pilgrims being persecuted once again at this time. And you also have the rise of, uh, of other groups in the surrounding area, area the, the, what are called the Seljuk Turks, a very aggressive warlike uh, group uh, in that time, and they'll play later in this story. Uh, the pilgrimage continue and actually increase during the persecutions, which is interesting, because Jerusalem itself is viewed as a, as I call it here, a holy relic. And uh, the people's devotion to Jerusalem and visiting the Holy Lands actually didn't decrease, which caused more of an outrage uh, when the incidents would occur. So, um, I also mentioned that uh, the Byzantine emperors rebuild uh, the Holy Sepulcher later, but it was a reconstruction on top of that site. Then you have a big battle between the Eastern Emperor, the Emperor of, the, of Byzantium, as it's called, and uh, the Seljuk Turks and the Islamic armies. And it's a major defeat for the East, the Eastern Emperors. So the Battle of Manzikert, a very famous battle in history. In fact, the Greek, the Greek Emperor was captured, later released after a ransom was paid. Uh, but that represents a permanent defeat, and most historians that we read will say that that was the beginning of the end of the Greek uh, Empire, which would eventually fall in 1450-something uh, to the Muslims. But the Battle of Manzikert in 1070, 71, was really the first uh, death knell for the Eastern Orthodox uh, and the Eastern Empire. The classical Seas of Christianity, Antioch, uh, Alexandria, are forever gone, and they never come back except momentarily during the crusading. There will always be Christian minorities there, but they, they don't get reclaimed in any official way ever again. The East and West, so Eastern Orthodoxy and Western Roman Catholicism, are in schism during the latter half of the 11th century, Overtures are made between the Pope and the Emperor about reuniting uh, for religious reasons and for political and military reasons at this time. So there's possibilities of reunification. Um, this is where the initial concept of the crusade is beginning to get formed, of how do we defend Eastern Christianity and protect the Holy Lands uh, for pilgrims who visit. It culminates in a letter from Alexius Comnenus, who's the emperor of Byzantium at this time, in and around 1091 AD. He writes a letter to one of the counts uh, asking for help. Now, in his letter, among other things, he asked for around 500 knights on horseback. So he, historians think he wasn't really asking for a formal launch of a crusade on the scale that followed, as much as I need help in a very tactical way. Uh, the letter details some pretty juicy things. I'll read this to you uh, uh, just to give you a flavor. So this is from the emperor to the Count of Flanders, around 1091 AD. O most illustrious count and special comforter of the Christian faith, I wish to make known to your prudence how the most sacred empire of the Greek Christians is being sorely distressed by the Turks, who daily ravage it and the promiscuous slaughter and indescribable killing and derision of the Christians. But since the evil things they do are many, and as we have said, indescribable, we will mention but a few of the many, which nevertheless are horrible to hear and disturb even the air itself. For they circumcise the boys in the use of the Christians over the Christian baptismal fonts, and in contempt of Christ they pour the blood from the circumcision into the said baptismal fonts and compel them to void urine thereon. And thereafter they violently drag them around in the church, compelling them to blaspheme the name of the Holy Trinity and the belief therein. But those who refuse to do these, thi refuse to do these things, they punish in diverse ways, and ultimately they kill them. 
noble matrons and their daughters, whom they have robbed, they one after another, like animals, defile in adultery. Some indeed in their corrupting shamelessly place virgins before the faces of their mothers and compel them to sing wicked and obscene songs until they have finished their own wicked acts. So I, I gave you the PG-13 portion of the letter. Uh, it does get worse. So you can see that uh, things are not, uh, not all going well out east. Now, if we continue, uh, around 1095, Urban II, who was pope at that time, uh, preaches the crusade. Uh, and he preaches the crusade... Uh, and we don't have the original text that Urban used, but, Urban used, but we have uh, what several listeners wrote down later. And most of it agrees on substance with what was said. So he, what's interesting about the letters that capture his speech is that he's trying to talk the knights and the dukes and the princes out of killing each other because there was continuous warfare going on in Western Europe at the time and to focus their energies on something noble and holy namely uh, reclaiming the holy lands for pilgrims, defending Eastern Orthodoxy, and killing Muslims to achieve those goals. Uh, he asked them to finance the crusade by mortgaging their lands or mortgaging the rents off of those lands. Uh, he describes it as a holy mission where the remission of sins can be accomplished if, with repentance and contrition, people enter into this holy mission and this holy war. Uh, so it wasn't something for nothing. It was a, a condition of any forgiveness to begin with, which is true repentance and contrition for any sin, whether you're going off to battle or not. But the, the point that the Pope was making is that to engage in this conflict of the First Crusade was such an extraordinary and tremendous thing for someone to undertake that if they had proper contrition and repentance of their sins, this would act the way we might understand as a, an indulgence, if you will, on the person. So they could merit uh, eternal life through the grace of uh, the indulgence of this. So, so far, straightforward uh, you know, Catholic teaching here. The response was incredible to the Pope. It was without precedent. It almost signaled a new moment of a united Christendom uh, in Europe, uh, albeit briefly. Uh, and because the response was so incredible, with the huge response from people, from princes and dukes down to common people, brought its own problems. Uh, this led, as I mentioned, to what I call rogue groups who did commit atrocities, who were in no way authorized by the Pope or the bishops in those locations. The Pope was authorizing princes, dukes, knights, to go out on the Crusades, the common people heard this and thought, that's fantastic, let's go. So if we go to the next page, I, and this is the first Crusade only, just to give you a summary briefly of who were the groups involved in the first Crusade, you can see the first three groups I mentioned there were, was a ragtag group of people. The first group was led by these uh, spiritual masters of the time, Walter the Penniless, Peter the Hermit, who were very popular with the people as spiritual guides. And they ran off first. Uh, there were thousands and thousands of these people. And they were in a hurry. They wanted to be the first to liberate the lands, and they got slaughtered uh, by the Turks. Uh, there were very few survivors. They didn't wait. They didn't organize. Uh, they simply went over to the Holy Lands as fast as they could. Uh, they wanted to... Uh, earn uh, what they thought they might be earning and were slaughtered. The next two groups are the ones that uh, killed the Jews in Germany and Eastern Europe. And uh, I give the names of the leader, Volkmar and Gottschalk. Uh, they never even made it to the Holy Lands because after the first group went through, the Hungarian knights at the time didn't exactly appreciate thousands and thousands of people rampaging through their country. So after these groups marauded the lands as they went east, uh, the, the Hungarian knights stopped them uh, by killing them. And so uh, this raises the questions of, well, the Crusaders killed the Jews, which these groups did, but it was never condoned. 
or authorized uh, by the pope or the bishop. And in fact, the bishops in the Rhine area where this occurred hid Jewish people from these crusading hordes. So when people make these blanket statements, uh, it's, it's kind of they're reading the top line of the cereal box. They're really not uh, understanding what happened, in fact. Finally, the, the group of princes who organized themselves had proper supplies and munitions and, and charted out their paths properly, did make it, uh, the five I list there, and eventually did liberate the Holy Lands in Jerusalem Falls in August of 1098 to the Crusaders. These five will squabble <laughs> uh, once they get there. They will squabble over different kingdoms and different uh, parts they want carved out for themselves. No question about that. Uh, but they eventually do make it and get there and liberate the Holy Lands, and the pilgrimages resume. So what can we observe about the Crusades uh, as a historical event or as evidence that, that Christians with power and weapons do crazy things? The first thing I would mention is that th this crusade meets the definition of just war theory. It is a defensive war to protect people from being killed by a foreign invader. In any war, there are abuses. Just war theory doesn't justify abuses or atrocities. Uh, but the point of this is that this crusade, and I'm talking about the first crusade in particular, uh, can be defended uh, using just war theory principles. Uh, and it, it is as simple as that. And you might recall from our uh, course last year on just war theory what those conditions are. Uh, I won't go over them now, but a war of defense to protect uh, allies from a foreign invader is entirely justified and proportionate. So uh, that is the core of what Urban II was also preaching when he preached the First Crusade in addition to its spiritual mission. It, something couldn't be a spiritual mission if it was unjustified morally. Uh, so that's point number one. A lot of people struggle with that because they think, well, wait a minute. How, how can a pope launch a war? Uh, how can Catholic princes and kings and dukes engage their armies directly in war like that? And the answer is simple. A justifiable war is a justifiable war. Maybe it's unseemly to us in the 21st century that clerics were on the battlefield, in fact. Uh, but we have army chaplains today who actually uh, wear uh, sidearms. Uh, in combat situations. So it's not so unusual. Uh, obviously, it's unseemly to us if a cleric was killing someone uh, today. Uh, however, uh, you can see how circumstances could arise where that could be justified to defend someone who's uh, vulnerable. So uh, generally, people who have a problem with the Crusades from a just war theory standpoint have a problem with just war theory. <laughs> no war is justified ever, for any reason. Rogue crusaders did kill Jewish people, but they were never authorized or condoned by the Pope or the bishops in Germany where it occurred. The Catholic princes did, did not do this for financial gain. In fact, it was a big loser financially for them. And as we'll see in a moment, it was one of the reasons why the crusade stopped. Uh, the sacking and looting did occur. Uh, we, we, you could spend a whole other class on warfare in uh, medieval times. Uh, I mention a few notes here about uh, when you're sieging a town, if the town holds out and there's greater loss of life, generally the people who are besieging the town get more angry, get more upset, more upset, and it's more likely that atrocities occur, which is why when towns were surrounded, um, they would often uh, discuss terms of surrender to avoid the atrocities from being committed. I'm not justifying the atrocities being committed. I'm just describing what would happen in medieval times. People will often say, well, the Crusades were about sacking and looting. That was why they all were in it, for that. And it raises the question, then why didn't uh, the Pope and the other princes and dukes sack Spain when the Crusaders were driven out of Granada, for example? Uh, why wasn't there a sacking of of Granada, and there was not. So 
Uh, it doesn't really hang that they were in it for financial gain because crusading comes to an end as soon as the princes and dukes say, let's start taxing the people <laughs> to finance the crusades because we're not financing it anymore. And that spelled the end of the crusades then. And there were other reasons why the crusades ultimately ended too. Uh, you have the rise of nation states who had their own interests and a united Christendom fighting Islam uh, will be the exception for the next uh, 300, 400 years, frankly. Uh, and so you never again will have a united Christendom fighting a foreign enemy like we had in the First Crusade. Uh, with the rise of kings in, in uh, France, in the UK, uh, Great Britain, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, all of the, the counties in Germany, there's not a united political will anymore. And so the Crusades ultimately come to an end. As a historical note, the last uh, holdout of the Crusader states was taken uh, back by uh, the Muslims in 1291. So those are the, that's a quick flyby of uh, the First Crusade, and much of the logic could be extended to the other Crusades as well, with some uh, exceptions that of so certain atrocities. But do people have any comments or questions on what I've covered so far? Do you see how uh, a, someone who uses the Crusades as a club to say this is what happens when uh, Christianity gets in power and they tend to go off on conquests of, on peace-loving Muslims uh, to take their lands from them it isn't even uh, in the ballpark of what happened historically. Yes, question. So the question is, what was the Muslim track record of when they took over territories, uh, how they treated the people. And interestingly, uh, they would do a couple things. They, would, they were for coexistence, but you had to pay a head tax. You could not practice your religion in public, uh, things like that. You, you weren't necessarily uh, imprisoned unless you uh, fought them. Uh, so there was a, you could consider on some level a humane treatment of the captives of these lands by Islamic leaders, uh, which is how they could grow so quickly. Uh, and so uh, they kept a military garrison in these countries to keep everyone in line. Uh, taxes were paid uh, if you were not uh, Muslim, uh, but the practice of your religion had to be uh, very much uh, in so secret. The, the question was, is the treatment of the pilgrim, the Christian pilgrims by the Muslims something part of the code uh, unique to them in some way? And we, we have to be careful now when we, when we look at this. Uh, Christian warriors have done similar things in battles as well to conquered populations. So we, we, we just have to be careful that we don't think that this is unique to Islam because it is not. Why don't we keep going because we have a lot to cover tonight. So let's move to the Inquisition, another uh, fun topic. But again, to understand the Inquisition, uh, we need to know some background. And what I mean is the culture in pre-Reformation Europe. And this is hard for us to imagine, but uh, it was certainly operative. So the first one I mentioned is that religious belief is something objective, uh, a gift from God. Uh, and not it's outside the realm of what I call private judgment, private uh, statements, where today we have the reverse. We think religion is completely subjective and individualized. So imagine a culture where uh, everyone thought religious belief was actually something objective. And uh, as I mentioned, private judgment of an individual was inferior to the shared tradition of communities over centuries. The wisdom of centuries uh, makes private judgment insignificant. The Catholic Church at this time is the uh, institution 
by which the faith is handed on authentically. There is no other mainline Christianity. Catholicism is the only Christian religion. There are obviously different rites, Armenian rites, etc. Coptic, Syriac, there are different rites, but Catholicism is the only Christian religion of any note at the time. As a result, if that's the dominant Christian religion and the only Christian religion, then public order that imperial rulers are concerned about is wrapped up with that. And as I mentioned here, uh, one of the more noted offenses that uh, imperial rulers, kings, dukes, princes are going to be concerned about is public disorder or heresy. And many rulers describe themselves, whether it's in their coat of arms or their heraldry, uh, as the defenders of the faith. And you might even remember Henry VIII was described by the Pope before Henry went off to uh, marry eight women as the defender of the faith. This other one I mentioned, it, it's not really mentioned very often, but it's something that I think is true. Uh, life expectancy at this time was short, you know, 40 years, 45 years on average. And so the comment I make here is there was no illusion that this world uh, is our home. Uh, think of all the babies that would die in childbirth. Think of all the mothers that would die in childbirth. Think of all the children who would die before they reached the age of four. Uh, that was common. Think of people who would die from a burst appendix. People, there was no helping those people. Uh, so death was common. It was a daily experience. And there was no illusion, as I put it, about this earth uh, being our home, which is so contrary to how we are today. And it does infect uh, preaching, uh, I find, whether we're talking, certainly not Catholic priests, Father excluded. Uh, but if you listen to the preaching today, it's often uh, uh, about just worldly concerns, which, of course, Christianity is about worldly concerns because it's about our union with God now, today. But Christianity is primarily about salvation, and there's a subtle shift in our preaching uh, where it becomes more concerned about, well, your faith is about how you become successful. Uh, the gospel of prosperity that you'll read about in books are sold on this basis. Discovering your true self through loving Jesus. The point is discovering your true self. Jesus is just a means to that. So there's this uh, this world concern that has infected uh, Christianity in the West in particular uh, today. It's completely opposite uh, in this time. Uh, the biggest misfortune was an eternal damnation. Uh, we often don't hear a homily on hell. Uh, it's obviously not an attractive topic, but hell does exist. It is a dogma of our faith. Jesus spoke of it. So, uh, not that we dwell on it, but never to talk about it is an odd contemporary uh, issue. So let's continue. So let's look at the first millennium of Christianity. So the first thousand years, how did they approach <clears throat> suppression of heresy? I mentioned some scriptural quotes because they will be relevant to what follows, and, and I didn't bring my uh, Bible with me, but the early church fathers, uh, even the apostles and Paul, uh, viewed heresy as a culpable offense that can lead to separation from the community, but not death, as the Jews had prescribed in Deuteronomy chapter 13 or, or uh, chapter 17. And the references to this of the Christian understanding that we don't kill people because of heresy, we expel them from the community for a time or permanently, you can read in First Timothy or in the letter to Titus. I have a quote here from Origen. Uh, 
he's writing against uh, Celsus, who was a, an interlocutor of his day, uh, arguing against Origen regarding Christianity. And uh, Origen uh, indicated that though the Mosaic Law commanded stoning, Christians now follow the law of Christ and are no longer at liberty to kill their enemies, burn or stone the violators of the Christian law. So uh, Origen, a central figure of the fathers of the church, is again uh, giving uh, words to the policy of early Christianity that expulsion, not death, is the, is the penalty for heresy. St. Cyprian of Carthage, who was surrounded by schismatics uh, during his career as bishop, um, I quote as, religion being now spiritual, its sanctions take on the same character, and excommunication replaces death of the body. Lactantius, who was the counselor to Constantine, wrote in 308 AD, religion being a matter of the will, it cannot be forced on anyone. In this matter, it is better to employ words than blows. Of what use is cruelty? What has the rack to do with piety? Surely there is no connection between truth and violence, between justice and cruelty. It is true that nothing is so important as religion, and one must defend it at any cost. It is true it must be protected, but by dying for it, not by killing others, by long-suffering, not by violence, by faith, not by crime. If you attempt to defend religion with bloodshed and torture, what you do is not defense, but desecration and insult. For nothing is so intrinsically a matter of free will as religion. Isn't that interesting? That was written in 308 AD. Uh, and reflects the sentiment at the time of, of early Christianity. If we continue, and again I'm just taking snapshots of, of this time. Uh, you see something interesting happen, and I'll, I'll try to accelerate my comments a little bit. With the rise of the Arian heresy, and Arius was uh, someone who thought that Jesus was a highly favored son of God, maybe a prophet, but not divine. And he began to use and manipulate the Eastern emperors to persecute Orthodox Christians. It's really one of the first times we have in history of a religious figure invoking the state to persecute and, and remove uh, any way you can. Don't tell me the details. Uh, his enemies, and one of his enemies was Athanasius, and who was actually kicked out of his diocese four times by the Arians uh, and hid in the mountains until the emperor would flip over and there would be one sympathetic to orthodoxy and he'd come back and, and get rid of the Arians. But there was a time in the fourth century where the majority of the bishops in the world were Arian heretical bishops because they used imperial power to suppress their enemies. So you have this phase uh, where the state begins to persecute people they deem as heretical. Uh, this ga gathers momentum, uh, and by the 5th century and into the 6th, you have imperial rulers also persecuting heretics to the point of taking property and executing them. There's ambivalence and reluctance fathers of the church and, and saints of the time that this is not a, a correct practice. I, I mentioned two quotes from Augustine there. Uh, he, he's asking for tolerance and describes the heretics almost benignly as straying lambs. There's something kind of comfortable about that expression. As he got older and was fighting more heretics, he was um, a little less sympathetic to them, shall we say, uh, and upheld the right of the state to punish, possibly in prison, uh, but not the rack or the sword, as he put it. One of the first people on record who's considered a saint through folklore is Saint Optatus of Malev, late 4th century. He's the first Catholic bishop on record uh, to argue for inflicting the death penalty on heretics. Uh, it is a minority view. It is not the predominant view of the church leaders of the time, but it's worth quoting, quote, as though it were not permitted to come forward as avengers of God and to pronounce sentence of death. But say you, the state cannot punish in the name of God. Yet was it not in the name of God that Moses and Phineas consigned to death the worshipers of the golden calf 
and those who despise the true religion. Interestingly, he refers to the Old Testament uh, to justify uh, his uh, claim. So this is a minority view. It's often pulled out as a quote to be reflective of the church of the time, uh, but it's not the majority view. So summary from the first millennium, the majority of church leaders from the apostles onward thought that blood should not be shed in suppressing heresy. And they positively said the old law of the Jewish faith has been superseded by the law of charity and, and love of enemies so that excommunication, not death, is the appropriate penalty. I mentioned the one outlier uh, who uses the Old Testament to justify uh, imposing a death sentence on a heretic. But it's this uneasy relationship that's forming between imperial rulers in the West and bishops. All of this gets sidetracked as Rome falls and the fragmentation begins, where Rome from, say, the 5th and 6th century on till Charlemagne really is a small frontier town on the western, it's a western suburb of the Eastern Empire, and it's not really uh, a driving factor in policy regarding the suppression of heresy. People don't realize that, but Rome was a minor city at this point in the empire. And in fact, uh, when the popes would write addresses to the people, they would date them based upon the Eastern Emperor's reign. Uh, so there was no uh, significance given to Western uh, power or control because there was none. There was just fragmented uh, tribes, princes in Western Europe. So let's jump to the historical context in medieval Europe. And these are little uh, notes I jotted down. I, I could have written hundreds of these anecdotes to give you the picture. And it's worth reading through this. But imperial rulers had to manage heretics in their kingdoms. Uh, and they had different names, different themes. The Manichaeanism, which was a dualistic religion that actually started in the 3rd and 4th centuries and didn't die out for a 1,000 years. It believed in a dualistic good God, evil God, flesh versus spirit thing. Uh, and they were very, uh, as I mentioned, very disruptive to uh, societies. Um, so often they were subversives politically. They didn't believe in the uh, supporting the king that was in power. Uh, they often had different views of the sacraments, namely the sacraments aren't signs of grace. Uh, they had sexual practices that were uh, libertine, uh, to say the least. Uh, because if, if, we're not, if we're at war with ourselves of spirit versus body, uh, in some thoughts that either means absolute uh, celibacy or wanton sexuality. Uh, so a very uh, disruptive group. Uh, we'll mention other groups as well that had similar practices. Uh, in 1022 AD, I'll just mention these quickly. Uh, king Robert the Pious, who was king of the Franks at the time, out of concern for the safety of his kingdom, had 13 distinguished citizens who were Manichees burned at the stake. Some of those included priests and uh, Catholic laymen. Around 1030 AD, the bishop of, of Shalom, due to the spread of Manichaeism, asked the bishop of Liege his advice on the use of force. Wazo, consistent with the fathers of the church from the first millennium, responded that force is not consistent with the gospel and its founder, but excommunication was. Quote, who ordained that the weed should be allowed to grow with the wheat until the day of harvest, lest the wheat be uprooted with the weeds? Those who today are weeds might tomorrow be converted and turn into wheat. Let them therefore live and let mere excommunication suffice. The implication is that uh, people were being executed. At Gossler, which is in Germany, during the Christmas seasons of 1051 and 1052, Henry III, to prevent the further spread of the her heretical leprosies, hung several heretics. 1036 AD, Catharis, another heretical sect, were condemned to the stake by the bishop. The city magistrates of Milan intervened to offer them a choice between doing homage to the cross 
or mounting the pyre, which is a, think of it as outdoor cremation and you're still alive. Uh, the majority of those heretics chose the funeral pyre. We'll get to what Cathars are in a moment. Uh, in 1114, the Bishop of Sassuan detained some heretics in his city while he traveled to Beauvais for a local synod meeting of bishops to ask their advice. What do I do with the heretics? While he was gone, locals dragged them outside and burned them. And I had to repeat this quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Believing folk, fearing the habitual soft-heartedness of ecclesiastics, <laughs> stormed the prison, took the accused outside of town, and burned them. I, I had to include that just because of the, some things are timeless, namely the soft-heartedness, and not that we would ever justify burning heretics, but you get the idea. It's, it never goes away. The bishops are always behind. Okay. I can say that because I'm not employed by them. In the seminary, I was sweet William, but uh, now I, I, you know, Father Brennan and I have to protect me. So... But continuing, Peter Cantor, some of you have heard of him, a, one of the greatest theologians of the 12th century, quote, whether they be convicted of error or freely confess their guilt, Catharis, these heretics, are not to be put to death, at least not when they refrain from armed assaults upon the church, one of the things they were doing. For although the apostle said, a man that is a heretic after the third ammunition, am, avoid, he certainly did not say, kill them. Admonition. There we go. He certainly did not say kill them. Throw them into prison, if you will, but do not put them to death. St. Bernard. By persuasion, not violence, are men to be won to the faith. He did recommend excommunication for people who were stubborn and possibly confinement, which is a gentle way of saying prison, uh, for the safety of others, because often Catharists were uh, suicide bombers of the time. You can see the trend emerging. The lay people are much more upset and fearful of what these heretics are doing on the ground. And the bishops are trying to figure out, what do we do about this? And, and, I'm, and that's a legitimate thing to want them to figure out. But there's a procrastination in the historical record that is interesting to me. In 1144, the Bishop of Liege tries to convert imprisoned heretics in his care but the people were much less patient, apprehended the prisoners, and burned them. The bishop rescued a few. In Cologne, the archbishop and priests tried to lead the heretics back to the church, but a mob seized them from the custody of the clergy and promptly burned them at the stake. By the 12th century, Catharism, Cathars, had spread throughout Germany, France, Spain, and were threatening the existence of the church in the regions where they had control. And therefore, they were also highly disruptive to the secular peace of those lands. I have to mention just a few of these. Uh, so Duke Philip of Flanders, assisted by the Archbishop of Reims, William of the White Hand. That, that sounds like a scary guy, actually. <laughs> William of the White Hand. Today we have uh, Donnie of the Soft Voice or something. But... Um, William of the White Hand, that sounds like a, a scary guy, began a more severe program against heretics, burning at the stake and confiscation of property. Bishop Hugo did the same to the Manichaeans, exile, burnings, and confiscation. King Philip of France burned priests, laymen, women who belonged to the Manichaeans. On and on and on. Uh, what's interesting is you have a mix here, but you have secular leaders primarily driving this in response to their people who are highly concerned and upset about subversive heretics in their presence, in their societies. By 1215, which is the Fourth Lateran Council, the church renewed the call to silence and imprison heretics, confiscate their property, but it does not recommend capital punishment. So the popes are pres prescribing broader canonical procedures, juridical procedures, not mobs grabbing people and dragging them out and burning them without any legal process. So you can see where this is going. 
continuing, and I, I add just a few comments on who are the Cathars. Why is this response happening in societies? Because we're apt to think, well, the people were overreacting. Uh, and, and so if you just examine for a moment who the Cathars are, some of their beliefs, they believe the Catholic Church's sacraments and life are a sham to be rejected. Oaths, oath-taking was uh, frowned on by the Cathars to king or country, marriage, and or the propagation of the human race. They wanted to be the last generation. There, there was a, a, an apocalyptic uh, theology the Cathars had. They wanted this all to end within their lifetimes. Suicide was a duty. Uh, so suicide bombers of today uh, are not original. Uh, and what's interesting is more Cathars died on their suicide missions in these societies and cultures than they did from the Inquisition. That's what they were seeking. So you could see why kings and princes and dukes and bishops and the people were so concerned about these people and stopping them. So laws spread and, and become more noted in the historical record of imperial rulers placing laws on the books to imprison, confiscate, and execute heretics. Uh, it had been going on, as we've seen, for 150 years, but codified in law begins to emerge in the historical record in the 13th century. This then is when uh, these laws start being incorporated into what I'll call inquisitional procedure. So tribunals, religious courts of law uh, begin to take on some of the practices that are already in place now by the imperial rulers to execute uh, heretics. What's interesting, and is if we turn the page, because <clears throat> I want to be sensitive to our time, let me start with inquisitional procedure, which is in the middle of that page on the Spanish Inquisition timeline. And this procedure was a, a humane step away from what the imperial procedure was, which was no trial, no witnesses called, uh, let the mobs have their way. There was a period of grace, 30 to 40 days, for facts to be confirmed and give the accused a chance to clarify their situation and be reconciled. Imprisonment would only result if the accused remained obstinate in heresy or the charge had been proven. Examination of the accused could only take place in the presence of two priests who functioned to restrain arbitrary acts of violence, which we've seen was common. Witnesses were sworn, and severe punishments, including death, were applied for false testimony against the accused, something that had never been done before. Uh, torture was applied, but at a much lower rate uh, than purely civic matters that didn't even involve heresy. And capital punishment was used. This procedure was common to all of Europe, it also was common in the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which I'm just doing a quick time check. Uh, I don't have time to cover all of this, but I'll go right to the headline, <clears throat> which is at the bottom. The total figure of people executed for heresy in the Spanish Inquisition from 1480 to 1800, when it was finally extinguished, was, let's call it, 5,000 people. And what's interesting, and it's in your bibliography, the book by Henry Kamen, he had access to archives in certain dioceses that hadn't been opened ever before, where he was able to count up all of you know, the, the dioceses of Toledo, of Castile, of Aragon, all these different places in Spain, Seville, Valencia. He, he got access to archives that hadn't been examined before by authors who write on the Inquisition. And he was shocked because he was ready to write a book on the Inquisition talking about the brutality of the Catholic Church. And he found the exact opposite, that in terms of the death counts recorded, uh, it was much smaller than what people had thought. So about 5,000 people over a 320-year period. Now, that's 5,000 people too many. Uh, so I'm not debating that. Of course, that was shameful and regrettable and wrong. I'm not defending it. Uh, I just note that statistic as we move forward here. Uh, but the, the conclusions um, 
are as follows. <clears throat> you know, coming out of the first millennium, religious leaders were attempting to restrain imperial authority from using the death penalty against criminals and heretics. As these heretical sects grew in the second millennium, in the 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, and on, it was harder and harder for the church to restrain imperial rulers because these groups were so disruptive to society. And eventually, uh, the church, when it instituted the Inquisition, uh, it adopted uh, this ultimate penalty as part of its uh, policy. So that much is true. Uh, Historians give reasons for this, and uh, there was a real fear on the part of church leaders of this ongoing encroachment and expansion of imperial rule into the life of the church. I'll give one quick example. The appointment of bishops. Uh, The popes fought over this power to appoint bishops in France, in the UK, with the kings. And even in France, until very recent times, uh, the French cardinals and Catholic leaders would submit a list to the pope of the bishops they would allow to be the bishop of Paris, etc. So these practices in some countries still go on. Uh, So this encroachment by imperial rule is something the popes and the bishops are fighting against. And to allow the imperial leaders to kill heretics without any procedures and determining what's orthodoxy, what isn't, that's a dangerous uh, precedent to uh, defer to uh, secular rulers. So the church had to get involved, and it got involved uh, in this way. There are other things I would mention, uh, but the other headline I would mention at the bottom here is that this should trouble us regardless of the historical period, whether we're talking about the Inquisition uh, in its legitimate forms or when it did execute uh, heretics. But we are in the area of discipline, not dogma. So the spirit-guided nature of the church uh, is not compromised by the bad behavior in these disciplinary matters. So always keep that in mind that we're not in the realm of dogma. We're in the realm of administration, of housekeeping rules that the church does not enjoy the protection of the Holy Spirit on. So if the Pope uh, tomorrow started talking about the Cubs winning the World Series, he's in the area of speculation. He's not in the area of dogma. He often speculates on other areas uh, uh, that may not be uh, areas of dogma as well. So these do not enjoy the assistance of the Holy Spirit. We are in the area of discipline. I also mentioned just by way of uh, precedent in the New Testament, uh, the apostles of Jesus got wrong. What do we do with Gentile Christians? Do we circumcise them? Are they subject to the dietary restrictions that Jews are subject to? Do they have to go to the synagogue? So even the followers of Jesus got matters of discipline wrong after the resurrection. So always keep that in mind that we are in the area of discipline here, not dogma. And we're in the area of bad behavior by people who claim to be Christian Catholic. Comment was St. Ignatius of Loyola was imprisoned by the Inquisition Uh, And my point is that that act of imprisonment is an area of discipline. Now, the subject matter might be matters of faith, but it is a disciplinary uh, item uh, of what the church is doing, not a dogmatic uh, statement. Okay. Other conclusions, and I apologize for going rapidly here, but I do want to get to the end of this. The irony is, as I study this more, the Inquisition was actually a humane step to add juridical procedures to what was, up to this point, mob action. So, a 30 to 40 day period of grace, the collecting of evidence, having two priests present uh, while the accused is being examined, uh, 
installing these procedures, I think we'd all agree, is a humane thing to do. Now, the fact that the church sanctioned uh, the death penalty uh, for heretics who did not recant, who were obstinate, etc., is less about the Catholic Church and more about the times. Now, that's often something people will dismiss as a rationalization. But I would just challenge you to uh, what I said earlier about using today's standards to evaluate uh, a period of time of five or 600 years ago. At the bottom of this, I give my opinion, and it's solely my opinion. I, I believe that if these heretical groups were not grave civic threats, that the church would not have supported the death penalty in the Inquisition. But it's precisely because these groups were threats to imperial rule and that rulers were using the death penalty, the church couldn't stop it and so had to participate in it to its shame and to its regret. So that's, that's a claim I'm making based upon the evidence I've seen. So that's the wind-up. Here's the pitch. So with that, people listening, maybe on YouTube later, will say, well, this history that you've just gone through the Crusades, and you only covered one Crusades, and Charles, you covered the easy one, because Crusades 2 through 4 were bloodbaths. Uh, You even had uh, people uh, after the Crusaders, I think it was the Third Crusade, when they sacked Constantinople, you had Eastern Christians saying, I'd rather have the turban than the tiara, the tiara being the pope's crown. They preferred Muslim rule to being looted by Western Christians. So I get all that. But listening to this uh, discussion on the Crusades or the Inquisition, and if you stopped here, you'd think this is what happens when religious people get into power. They slaughter people on a grand scale. Well, we've seen that in the Inquisition in Spain, which is the the largest one and had the longest charter of 350 years, 5,000 people were executed in 350 years. So let's look at just one century of secular regimes in operation. Uh, We won't even consider Asia, uh, its it's, uh, 2,000 years history until the 20th century. But let's take a look at the worker paradises that uh, were promised Uh, in terms of uh, staying alive, or as I put it, let alone the quality of life, uh, bread lines, uh, boots that don't fit, or no boots at all when winter comes. Lenin, 9 million dead in a a 10-year period. Stalin, 20 million uh, died in in 30 years. Mao Zedong, 40 million people uh, died during his reign. Hitler, uh, It's an easy one. People generally don't try to defend him much. Um, Ten million, but not including the dead from World War II. Pol Pot, uh, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, two million dead. If you read about post-colonial Africa after World War II, for example, uh, if you go across the different uh, countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Mozambique, the Sudan, the Congo, 13 million dead. When I was going through uh, Deer Path School as a grade schooler, the French Revolution was taught as this wonderful liberation of humanity uh, and this wonderful move of promoting the ideals that we reflect in our U.S. Constitution, liberty, equality, fraternity. 40,000 people were killed in a year at the guillotine in Paris and outside of Paris. Uh, It's funny, when the French Revolution is taught in the reign of terror that followed it, This isn't dwelled on. It wasn't dwelled on that they put Eucharistic hosts in cannon and shot them as cannon fodder against the people they were executing. They didn't teach me at Deer Path. They taught taught that this was a wonderful liberating event in history, a sign of the age of reason. Uh, And and that Notre Dame Cathedral, we had the the Blessed Mother replaced by the goddess of reason. What a wonderful thing. This body count, don't let that bother you because we know that religious people in power are bloodthirsty. You see how laughable this is? Uh, Direct abortions in the U.S. alone, let's not even talk about China or Western Europe, is a holocaust. 47 million uh, abortions in this country uh, over the last 42 years and counting. So if you compare these statistics 
to what we just covered on the Inquisition or the Crusades, uh, it, there's no comparison. Uh, the total number of deaths of the Spanish Inquisition is a Tuesday afternoon in Moscow in 1930. Or it's the average carnage, as I put it here, daily in this country at an abortion mill. So you see how someone's not being truthful uh, ab about this conversation in terms of, well, religious people in power are dangerous. And if we just have secular, benign, agnostic regimes, uh, everything will be well. It is a profoundly unaware or devious ignorance of history. I'd like to uh, read a quote to you uh, by David Bentley Hart. It's also in your bibliography in a book he wrote entitled Atheist Delusions. Quote, part of the enthralling promise of the age of reason was at least at first the prospect of a genuinely rational ethics, not bound to the local or tribal customs of this people or that, not limited to the moral precepts of any particular creed, but available to all reasoning minds regardless of culture, and when recognized, immediately compelling to the rational will. Was there ever a more desperate fantasy than this? We live now in the wake of the most monstrously violent century in human history, during which the secular order, freed from the authority of religion, showed itself willing to kill on an unprecedented scale and with an ease of conscience worse than merely depraved. If ever an age deserved to be thought an age of darkness, it surely is ours. And continuing, it is at the very least no longer possible to believe in naive enlightenment fashion that moral truth is something upon which all reasonable persons can agree, or that it is something that in being grasped exercises an irresistible appeal upon the will. Nor is it possible any longer to deceive ourselves that humanity, free from religious authority, must inevitably advance toward higher expressions of life rather than retreat into pettiness or cruelty or barbarism. Either human reason reflects an objective order of divine truth, which awakens the will to its deepest purposes and commands its assent, or reason is merely the instrument and servant of the will, which is under no obligation to choose the path of mercy or of rational self-interest or sympathy or of peace. So you have a very uh, biting statement from David Bentley Hart that we should grow up and recognize that secular regimes and societies left to themselves, if the 20th century is any evidence, we could look at other centuries too, uh, is, is evidence that there is no su such thing as a benign secular regime in practice. It sounds nice conceptually, but in practice it's monstrous. So, conclusions, and then we can open up for questions and wrap up. Corrupt people in power kill innocent people. That's a fact of history. It just so happens statistically, and, and I could have mounted more evidence and more data, but corrupt secular people in power kill at about a 20,000 to 1 rate versus corrupt church people in power. Why is that? Well, consider throughout history, are you more likely to survive under a regime who, whose ideals are, all that, are that all people are created in the image and likeness of God? Or that measures your worth as a citizen to some outside standard or functional performance like Oh, being over the age of nine months from conception, or race, or class, or your religion, or your IQ. If you were a mentally ill person in Germany in the 1920s, you didn't have good prospects. And a lot of what happened in the Holocaust to the Jewish people happened on a smaller scale to mental patients in German hospitals in the 20s and 30s, which is where the euthanasia movement came from which is also where Margaret Sanger got her ideas, who's the founder of Planned Parenthood. How about a society that can justify directly intended violence against moral innocence? Or one that does not respect freedom of religion and rational inquiry, consistent with the dignity of the person who is man and woman equally? 
Or how about a society that bases its religion on a private revelation to an individual not accessible by others and without rational critique but to be simply followed under threat of violence? Which society do you think an innocent has a better chance in? And why do you think the body count is in the hundreds of millions in secular regimes throughout history and it's a fraction in the, in the subjects we've covered tonight of the Inquisition or the Crusades? I would suggest the ideals of a society religiously inspired are much more humanizing and life-giving and with the possible of human flourishing than secular societies that hold up other ideals that you better measure up to or you won't last long. Let me wrap up with a, uh, or I better wrap up, right? Uh, David Berlinski in a work, The Devil's Delusion, not The Devil's Pretension, but it's correct in your bibliography. He is a mathematician. Uh, uh, he lives today in France. Uh, he's highly a provocative writer on subjects of math and science and cosmology. And as I've listened to a lot of his interviews, he cryptically refers to his ancestors uh, at the hands of the Germans and the Nazis. And he, he wrote this uh, in his book, The Devil's Delusion. Quote, in the early days of the German advance into Eastern Europe, before the possibility of Soviet retribution even entered their untroubled imagination, Nazi extermination squads would sweep into villages and, after forcing villagers to dig their own graves, murder their victims with machine guns. On one such occasion, somewhere in Eastern Europe, an SS officer watched languidly his machine gun cradled as an elderly and bearded Hasidic Jew laboriously dug what he knew to be his grave. Standing up straight, he addressed his executioner. God is watching what you are doing, he said. And then he was shot dead. What Hitler did not believe, and what Stalin did not believe, and what Mao did not believe, and what the SS did not believe, and what the Gestapo did not believe, and what the NKVD did not believe, and what the commissars, the functionaries, the swag swaggering executioners, Nazi doctors, Communist Party theoreticians, intellectuals, brown shirts, black shirts, and a thousand party hacks did not believe was that God was watching what they were doing. That is, after all, the meaning of a secular society. A very powerful quote. My sense is that it's personal also. Let me wrap up, because I want to plant seeds for our fifth class, and then we can take questions and, and uh, conclude. But I, I want to make a couple of points that are on the page. I, I want to make a deeper point uh, that I've, that before I've made. But what atheistic secular regimes are trying to do is to make religious their goals. They want the same religious commitment and fervor to their secular goals that we naturally have as Catholics or Christians to what is sacred for us in our faith. The problem with that is that when you make secular things religious or sacred, you don't get some benign outcome, historically speaking. You get something monstrous. You get something barbaric. Because if you don't comply with earthly goals, and there, are, there is nothing else, then the individual is always going to be subject to the earthly program and be smaller than it. What's one person in comparison to a thousand-year right? There's no comparison at all. You will be dealt with. Or a Soviet-style uh, program in your country. Everything is subjected to the state. The state is the end. The state is the goal. The citizen is just a drop in, in this larger bucket of water. When you make that religious, you're going to exterminate people. And history shows that you are going to brutalize and pulverize humanity. Because when you make something sacred that isn't sacred, there's something de demonic about that, which will develop a, a bit later. But think about that for a moment. Uh, we believe in a faith that regards the individual of infinite worth. 
The individual has infinite value. Why? It was created in the image and likeness of God. Any individual has more worth than the entire created universe and its entire human history. And Jesus Christ would come and die for one person to save that person. You see how that is not only true, but it promotes human flourishing and human dignity. It's the basis of our right to life and all the other rights we claim. When global secularists deny those foundations and hold up other goals that are horizontal and secular and godless, everything is going to be subject to that goal because there is nothing else to live for. And you comply or you will be facilitated out of society one way or the other. You will not participate. So I'm planting seeds for our last class when we talk about relativism, which is the new atheism in our culture and in the West and what it means and what we can do about it. Uh, the good news, as I mentioned here, is that we are naturally religious. We naturally seek, seek the fullness of truth, life, and love. When counterfeits are offered by secular regimes, we get the disastrous outcomes that I've chronicled for you, and we, and we make obvious that our problem is not religious people in power. The problem is godless people in power, as the historical record shows, not being informed by Judeo-Christian principles, but being informed by ridiculous horizontal principles. The precedent, of course, and is a clue to our way out of secularism, is how did Jesus respond to the three temptations of the devil? And the substance of those three temptations, turn these stones into bread, perform feats of jumping off the uh, top of buildings and not being injured, and then finally bowing down to me in exchange for the world. All three of those have in common one thing, liberation, is not from sin, it's from bad economic and political systems. And when we substitute that liberation for the counterfeits, when we substitute true freedom in Christ, who is the truth, the way, and the life, for the secular counterfeits, we get the destruction of society and the human person. And the historical record is obviously showing that. And any honest person who examines the body counts of the historical record would come to that conclusion. So with that, uh, that will set up class five. Uh, are there any questions, uh, though, before we wrap up? Class four I'll talk about in two seconds, but I just want to finish up class three. Okay, so coming attractions, class four, is about uh, how to read the Bible, how to understand the Bible, because uh, believe it or not, uh, the Bible and the fact that there are about 41,000 Christian denominations in the world is a source of confusion for the person who is secular and maybe examining Christianity for the first time. And he's wondering, how should I even approach the Bible? How should I even understand these 41,000 different Christian denominations? That, believe it or not, is a barrier to people coming to belief. So in class four next week, We'll examine what is the Bible, how to read it, how to even understand the Bible as a text. And it will point to clues to removing that, far from being a barrier, as a source of revelation of God to the world. So that will be class four. And then class five will wrap up on this theme of the dictatorship of relativism and true Christian liberation. Thanks again tonight for coming. <laughs>